Hello readers and parents and families and teachers and everyone and I guess dogs as well. Um, it's great to be here. I'm Lauren and I'm here to do a read aloud of I Survived the Destruction of Pompeii, but this is a little different than just a read aloud. I am going to be reading two chapters at a time, but I'm also going to send you on a quest. At the end of each of my readings, I'm going to give you something to do that will help you kind of go into the world of the people of ancient Rome and Pompeii. And by the end of this whole read aloud, you're not only going to have heard my story, but you're going to know a whole lot of things. So before I do that, I want to do some shout outs. Parents and teachers, the best way to do a shout out for me is to go on Twitter because I noticed they're on, they're all over the place a little bit right now. So if you want to shout out to someone special to you, just come on Twitter and tell me and I would love to do it. So today our shout outs are to the kids of JFK Middle School in Enfield, to Raina from Pittsburgh, to Reno Kids, to students at Roby Elementary, to Mrs. Frisch's fourth graders, to Kyle, to the readers of Arlington Elementary, to Team Kirk from Charles Reed Elementary, to Levi, to Mrs. Jacobies, or is it Mrs. Jacobies, second grader, to Mrs. McDowell's fourth graders, to Emma and Mrs. Houston's second grade class, to Ben and Sam, to Oliver and Owen, to Josiah, to Carter, and to Josh. So special hello to all of you, but a huge hello to the rest of you too. All right, so here we go. Let me tell you why I love this book, because this, I knew nothing about Pompeii and ancient Rome, and this book took me back through my research almost 2,000 years to an ancient city at the foot of a, of a volcano. Um, that was completely buried by this historic explosion. So you're gonna, I'm just really excited to not only take you into my story, but to have you start to learn all the amazing things that I learned through this. So here we go, chapter one. And by the way, I dedicated this to my daddy, to Barry. And the name in in Latin, Latin was the language of ancient Rome, and the language, the the word Tata, needs means dad in Latin. So I wrote here for Barry Tarsus, my Tata. August twenty fourth, A.D. seventy nine, one o'clock p.m. The city of Rome, the Roman Empire. Within hours, thousands of people would be dead. The entire city of Pompeii would vanish under more than 30 feet of fiery ash and stone. But first, it was a bright and sunny summer day. Shops bustled, kids played ball in a grassy field, gladiators readied for a bloody match. Nobody yet knew that the mountain Vesuvius, which loomed over the city, was actually a deadly volcano. The mountain had been silent for centuries, a giant green triangle covered with farms and meadows and forests. It was impossible to imagine what lurked under the ground, rivers of boiling magma, swirls of poisonous gases. Any moment, the mountain would erupt with devastating fury. 11-year-old Marcus was, was with his father, Tata. They shouldn't have been anywhere near Pompeii. They were escaped slaves running for their lives from evil men. But then, boom, boom, with two shattering explosions, Vesuvius erupted. Thousands of pairs of eyes turned toward the mountain, staring in shock and terror. Black, billowing smoke and ash gushed out of the mountain's gaping mouth. Vesuvius roared like a furious beast, breathing smoke and flames into the sky, and then came an even bigger cloud, shooting out billions of hot, jagged rocks that rained down on Pompeii, filling fountains, crushing roofs, and pounding down on people as they tried to flee, screaming in panic. The gods are punishing us. The world is ending. Marcus and Tata knew they had to escape. Any minute, a flaming wave of ash and gases would rush down the mountain, burning everything in its path. But there were too many people in the street, too many rocks falling from the sky. It was hard to breathe, almost impossible to see. And then there was the strange whooshing sound that came from above. Look out, Tata shouted. 
Marcus looked up just in time to see a massive flaming boulder falling from the sky, a chunk of fiery rock from deep inside the mountain. It was heading right for them. So that's the end of chapter one. Now, I don't know if many of you have read other I Survive books, but here's a question for you to just think about. Maybe you can write this down. My chapter ones in my I Survive books are a little different than chapter ones in a lot of other books, right? So what I do is, is actually I write the book, I start in chapter two, and then I write the whole book. And then at the very end, what I do when I think I'm almost done is I go into the book and I try to find an exciting scene and I rewrite it and that becomes chapter one. So my question is, why would, why would I do that? Am I, am I just trying to confuse you? Or is there something that I'm trying to, that I want to happen to you when you read that first chapter? Maybe we'll talk about that in the last read aloud. Why, why do I try to make chapter one extra exciting? And why do I not start just in the beginning of the story? So here's chapter two, which is really the beginning. August 23rd, AD 79, the afternoon before, Main Street, Pompeii. Marcus walked along the dusty Main Street of Pompeii, carrying a smelly sack stuffed with his master's dirty laundry. It was early afternoon and the street was packed with people, shoppers sifting through bins of pomegranates and melons, weary slaves collecting water from the fountains, beggars holding out their grimy hands. A snake charmer dozed while his cobra peeked out of its basket, tasting the air with its flicking tongue. Salve, Marcus said, a friendly Latin hello for the deadly reptile. If only he had a basket to hide in right now. There were no good days for Marcus lately, but this day was sure to be more miserable than usual. It was broiling hot and his ragged tunic was soaked in sweat. Even worse, his master, Festus Julius, was expecting important guests from Rome that evening, friends of the emperor. This meant even more backbreaking work than usual for Marcus and the other slaves. For days, they'd been scrubbing the villa so that the mosaic floors shined like diamonds, so that every silver bowl and goblet gleamed. The guests would arrive by chariot, men in flowing white togas, women in silk robes and painted red lips, jewels flashing from every finger. Tonight, there would be a great feast of roasted flamingo and wild boar, honey-baked mice stuffed with raisins and dates, and lobsters as big as cats, the guests would lounge on silken couches and gorge themselves until they threw up and then their stomachs empty, they would eat more. Tomorrow, Festus would take them all to the gladiator fight at Pompey's amphitheater. From front row seats, they would cheer as warriors tried to stab one another to death with swords, spears, and daggers. People were coming from all over to see the spectacle, which featured Pompey's champion fighter. He was a giant of a man who had lost an eye in one of his early battles. The injury had earned him the fighting name of Cyclops, after the one-eyed monster from the old Greek tales. Like almost all gladiators, Cyclops was a slave who was forced to fight, and he was one of the lucky few still alive after many battles. Just thinking about these brutal tournaments horrified Marcus. Suddenly his whole body was shaking. But wait, it wasn't Marcus who was trembling, it was the earth beneath his feet. Marcus dropped his sack and braced himself against a stone fountain. A huge marble statue of the warrior Achilles looked down on him. Marcus wished he felt as brave as Achilles, but these tremors spooked him. For weeks, they'd, they'd been shaking the city, putting cracks in the walls of Festus's villa, sending his spoiled dogs into fits of howling. Usually the quakes were quick ending just, just in just a few seconds. Most people seemed to barely notice them, but this quake was more powerful than most. The ground shuddered and shook, harder and harder. Up and down the street, the sound of shattering glass and splintering wood and crumbling stone pounded Marcus's ears. Crash, bang, crack. Vendors cursed as their baskets of fruit and vegetables toppled. A bamboo birdcage fell and burst open, scattering a flock of tiny white birds into the dusty air. Barrels rolled wildly through the streets, gushing wine as red as blood. Marcus held tight to the fountain as the water inside it sloshed, splashing over the rim and soaking his tunic. And then he heard it, a cracking just over his head. Marcus looked up just as the massive marble statue of Achilles came crashing down on top of him. So that's where we're going to leave Marcus 
at the end of chapter two. But here's what I want you to do before tomorrow when I'll be back to start reading chapter three. I want you to do a little exploring. You can talk to who is ever with you at home or you can try to look online, talk to your teacher maybe, talk to your friends. I want you to find Pompeii on a map. Where is it? I want you to f tell me what country Pompeii is in because I don't say that in the book, and that country didn't even exist almost 2,000 years ago. I want you to find out a couple things that I mention here. I want you to learn a little bit about what was a toga. Look that up. What is a toga? Um, I want you to find out, you know, what, I want you to try to find a little more about gladiators. The thing about what I do in my books is, is I think I've told you before, maybe in my last read aloud, is that I'm writing a genre that's called historical fiction. So what does that mean? It means that all the history is true, all the facts that I write about are true, so I did research to learn what, what did people in ancient Rome really eat? I did learn that they loved to eat stuffed mice and flamingos and all sorts of things we don't eat today. Um, what's a chariot? That's another thing I want you to find out. What's a chariot? That's how people got around back in ancient Rome. So um, all of those things are factual and I research them by going to Pompeii, going to this city and looking around and talking to experts and going to museums and reading books and watching videos and studying maps, studying paintings, statues, but all the characters are fictional. So, so Marcus is a fictional character, but he is based on, on real, what it would have been like for a real kid to live in ancient Rome in Pompeii. So you're going on a little quest for me and I want you to try to find out as much as you can about Pompeii and about ancient Rome. Um, and I'm hoping you're gonna do that tonight. And so tomorrow morning when you join me for the next read aloud, you're gonna know a little bit more. So until then, bye to you all. Okay, so here's your quest for today. Find out where Pompeii is. You can probably, you, you can ask someone, but maybe here's a hint. Find Mount Vesuvius and you should be able to find Pompeii. I want you to also find out what a toga is, what a chariot is. Another thing I want you to find out is this story happened in the year AD 79. What does AD stand for? Most people think they know what it means, but um, and I did, but I was really surprised to learn I was wrong. So you have the chance to find out what AD really means. And you can also, while you're at it, find out what BC means. Okay, see you next time for chapters three and four.